Welcome to the eighth lecture of MEC 4428 Advanced Dynamics. We're continuing to talk about analytical dynamics. In particular today we're going to talk about, uh, first we're going to begin with generalized forces, but we're also going to be talking, if you look over here at the right, uh, Lagrange multipliers and uh, how to do Lagrange multipliers with a specific example. And then uh, talk about general procedure of using Lagrange's equations, which will really finish up all of our worry about analytical dynamics for this particular course, unfortunately. With regard to generalized forces, there is an easier way to determine the generalized forces Q prime sub i. Remember that the prime is from the non-conservative forces. Okay, and this presumes then that, of course, the conservative forces are found using uh, or, or handled using the potential energy function V. Remember that delta W is equal to uh, some of the forces uh, dotted with uh, virtual displacements. Well, we also had that the, that, that the virtual work is defined at least with regard to the non-conservative forces, right, as Q prime sub J delta Q J. Right, that's too many to correct that. All right, so normally we'd say that delta qj is not equal to zero for j, one, two, three, four, all the way through to n, so for all of our particular uh, coordinate system directions, and that delta qj is not equal to delta qi, for i it's not equal to j. So you'd have one virtual displacement in a particular uh, coordinate, it isn't the same as a virtual displacement, necessarily anyway, then another coordinate. It might be, but it might not be, is my point. All right, so, and then as well, then the virtual work is equal to zero. Finally, we might say that uh, delta qj is independent of delta qi whenever i and j aren't equal to each other. So now I suppose that we could say that delta qj could be zero, just just for the purpose, the only reason we're doing this is just a reason for us to find the generalized forces and in an easier way, all right? So suppose that we say delta qj could be zero for all j, one, two, n, except for one value of j. So in here, and this must be our j, we could say that all of this is going to turn out to be zero except for one particular value of j, okay? Jeez. qj prime delta qj. And all the other ones are gone for the moment, all right? So then we'll say that this is sort of like saying this is delta w sub j. That's a virtual work done for just that particular displacement, okay? And this isn't necessarily equal to zero anymore, and so then this and then this aren't valid anymore. The first and the third of those statements isn't valid anymore. And this is most definitely not, this is not anything to do with virtual work or any of the stuff that we talked about before. But we can use this to find the generalized forces. We're saying that all virtual displacements of the system's independent generalized coordinates are zero except for one. Now look and we'll see what happens in a pendulum mass system. So let's look at it. We've got a pendulum mass system, all right, and this mass moves horizontally back and forth and has a pendulum, a tied, a pendulum tied to it, and there is gravity here shown at the right-hand side, and we have a spring, and the spring is providing a force F sub s, and of course it's a vector, and along minus kx e sub x, where x is defined to the right here. What we're looking for are the generalized forces qx and q theta, and we're, so we're going to say that x and theta are generalized coordinates. All right, so let's take a look and see. If we let delta x not equal to zero, but delta theta equal zero. Remember, this is part of our construction way for our easier way. Then delta w f s dot dx, delta x that is, is equal to minus f s delta x. Remember how I said that, you know, if we work out generalized coordinates correctly, generalized forces might be, in, uh, these forces might end up being in the same direction. Right? Well, isn't that interesting how this works out? The f of s dot delta x to go to minus fs delta x, but delta w is equal to qx delta x plus q theta delta theta. The delta theta here, we're treating it for the moment now as it's going to be zero, so that's qx delta x. So then as it turns out that qx is equal to minus f of s. Okay. Notice that we didn't use a prime here. And the reason is, is that because this is actually this particular force is a conservative force, or we might be able to treat it that way. 
Now, let's try the other one. If we've let this one be not equal to 0 and this one 0, then let's try it the other way around. Then delta w is equal to mg e sub z dot l delta theta sine theta e sub z with a minus 1 in there. And you can see that from this right-hand figure. That's equal to minus mgl sine theta delta theta. So then that's delta uh, qx delta x. But this first term right is 0 because we have presume that delta x in this particular case is equal to 0. And q theta delta theta is then equal to minus mgl sine theta delta theta. And that's our answer for our q theta as our generalized force. So just in general, if you want to find generalized forces, let's make a, we'll make a virtual displacement delta qi on one and only one generalized coordinate qi. All other displacements are zero. Find how work is done by the externally applied forces due to the displacement delta w. When you make this displacement, be sure it is consistent with constraints, all right? So it, it's the same as the previous lectures. It always has to be consistent with the constraints. You can't violate that. Find how the work is done by the externally applied forces due to the displacement delta w. And this will let you find qj for j, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through to n. Okay, and the idea is pretty simple in that this is the generalized forces overall. Or this, these are the forces that you have in your system that do virtual work, and this is related to the generalized forces. Okay, and just keep repeating for each coordinate, a coordinate, and see what you get. This always works for holonomic systems, by the way. There is, the, there is no way for it to fail for holonomic systems. Remember what this term is. If you don't remember, then go back and take a look. Don't mistake this delta w from the delta w from virtual work. That delta w is equal to zero, but this one is not, okay? They're totally different things. Let's try it on another example. If we have a pendulum with a magnet and um, a magnetic bob that repels to each other, it repels each other, as you've seen maybe this is a toy or something, you can buy this in like, um, you know, stores and so forth where you have a magnetic bob and you have a magnet underneath a wooden table and then it moves really weird because of the interactions of this magnet and that magnet. Okay, and there's a force, Fm against the bob. If we look at the equation motion, we'll use, um, we'll actually use this in such a way that we don't have to worry about the kinetic energy. The potential energy will treat in here in the, in the as generalized force. And the kinetic energy is 1 half ml squared theta dot squared. And with virtual displacement in theta, say, then we'd have the forces. And some of the forces externally applied. F sub m for the magnet plus mg dot delta y, which is going to be equal to delta w. And that's not going to be necessarily equal to zero. So then we'd have f sub m minus mg e sub y dot delta y e sub y equals delta w. That's f sub m minus mg delta y. Now your y is related back to the theta through, um, uh, because we have really only one degree of freedom here. And delta y is equal to minus sine theta delta theta and delta w in turn then is mg minus f sub m, that quantity times sine theta delta theta which is equal to q theta delta theta. q theta then has to be mg minus f sub m sine theta. So then we're able to write out what the equation of motion would be in terms of theta here because we know what q theta is and that works out not too bad because there's only one degree of freedom and in particular the generalized forces are really not too bad to find with these single degree of freedom systems. If you look at a multi degree of freedom system then it gets to be a little more interesting. The kinetic energy again, we're going to treat that um, as say the kinetic energy of two masses shown here, one, two, and are each a little cart that's rolling on a friction free surface. And we'll define the position of the first one to the left here is as Q1. The, the one on the right is Q2. Virtual displacement is uh, delta Q1. Virtual displacement for the second one is delta Q2. And then we have springs attached here, K1 to a fixed frame to M1, and then K2 between M1 and M2. The kinetic energy is just 1 half M1 Q1 dot squared plus 1 half M2 Q2 dot squared. The spring force is on M1, for example. Well, if we say that delta Q1 is not equal to 0, delta Q2 is equal to 0, 
Well, let's look at our virtual work. It's minus k1 q1 plus k2 times quantity q2 minus q1 delta q1. In other words, that's q1 delta q1. So this helps us find what the generalized force q1 would be. Notice that this doesn't say that q2 is equal to zero. It says that delta q2 is equal to zero, all right? So our displacement q2 might not be equal to zero, but our virtual displacement in q2 is equal to zero. So if we do that for Q2, we find uh, what the spring is, spring force there is, and we end up with our two equations of motion as shown here. All right. This is our first equation of motion. Here's our second equation of motion. Now it turns out that if you do this using potential energy, we can end up with a similar sort of solution. And uh, the sum of the forces on each mass gives a generalized force for the associated coordinate. That isn't always the way it's going to work out. All right, you can't use Newton's second law to find what the sum of the forces is, and that's not always going to be the generalized forces. It turns out it works this way because each of the generalized force coordinates describe each mass's location with respect to a fixed location. All right, if, it's, if the generalized coordinates are defined with respect to, say, a moving location, then this may well be violated. Let's let Q2 be the distance from M1 to M2, not to the, not the left wall to M2. So instead of defining it from here, we'll define it from here to M2. So from M1 to M2. The kinetic energy is a bit different, isn't it? This time, the, for the first mass, it's still the same. But for the second mass, it's actually Q1 dot plus Q2 dot quantity squared. The spring forces on each mass, well, if we say that delta Q1 is, is not equal to 0 and delta Q2 is equal to 0, then the work done is minus k1 q1 plus k2 q2 delta q1 so q1 is minus k1 q1 plus k2 q2 and if we reverse the situation where delta q2 is equal not equal to zero then delta w is minus k2 q2 delta q2 in other words q2 is equal to minus k2 q2 all right so this is how our equations of motion end up being here and here equations are different but the motion they describe would be the same and the danger that you run into here is that if you just say that the sum of the forces um, is equivalent to writing what Q1 is and some of the forces is equivalent to what Q2 is, it won't always work. You have to do something along this way and refer back to that virtual work statement. Otherwise, you might end up doing things, getting something quite out of order. Some applied forces are proportional to the velocity, like those due to viscous dampers. And it turns out that um, you can actually model those in a way that you can avoid using generalized forces to determine their influence. If, for example, you can use Rayleigh's dissipation function, it's called, and we'll call that D in here, you'll find that every book uses a different, a different form from uh, a script uh, H to, say, a script F for whatever reason, and I have no idea why any of those letters are used but D for dissipation for us. And here we'll say that it's one half the sum of a damping coefficient C sub J times Q dot, notice a dot there, Q sub J squared. All right, so for example, mass spring damper system shown here at the right, so we got a mass, a spring, and damper, it's one degree of freedom with an applied force F sub D. We all know what the equation of motion is, it's right here, MX double dot plus CX dot plus KX equal F sub T, F of T. And if we use Rayleigh's dissipation function, well, we have to look at what's happening to the damper here. And it turns out that if this is moving at x dot, this end is fixed. Then so the Rayleigh's dis dissipation for this particular damper is x dot minus zero, uh, quantity squared times c times one half. And then, of course, kinetic energy is one half mx dot squared, and v is one half kx squared. Notice the similarity between the dissipation and the kinetic energy. It's not by accident. So then the Lagrangian then ends up being 1 half mx dot squared minus 1 half kx squared. And by using our Lagrange's equations, we'd end up with mx double dot plus kx. Now, if we add in partial of d with respect to x dot, turns out that we end up with mx double dot plus cx, plus k, CX dot plus kx uh, gets us our very close to our equation of motion, doesn't it? If you look at the generalized force, notice that we're leaving out the dissipation. Why? Because we've already got it in terms of Rayleigh's dissipation function here. 
right, in this term. And so then we have the generalized applied forces, delta W is equal to F of T, delta X is equal to Q prime, non-conservative, sub so X, delta X, and so QX is just F, MX double dot plus CX plus dot plus KX is equal to F of T. Same as before. Well, I guess we're lucky that m the math and all this works. In general, you can write it. This is original Lagrange's equations that I've underlined here. Prime derivative of the partial of L with respect to Q uh, dot sub i minus partial of L with respect to Q sub i plus partial of D with respect to Q sub i dot is equal to Q prime sub i, where the, of course, you've got your Lagrangian for your L, and then the Rowley's dissipation function is D, one-half CI times Q dot sub I squared, okay, for systems with viscous dissipation. And what all this means is, is that the energy lost is is proportional to the velocity the velocity squared of the dampers themselves. Not of the masses, but of the dampers. You have to be careful here. The kinetic energy here is one half m1 q1 dot squared, right? For There's our one mass, here's the other mass. That's for our kinetic energy, potential energy. Well, it's because of the springs. We'd have a spring here being stretched, and since the left-hand side is fixed and only affected by q1, here it's defined from the fixed location, K2 is the difference between Q2 and Q1's quantity squared. But then the damping, notice how the damping looks very much like the damping coefficient of Rayleigh's dissipation function looks like the potential energy, not the kinetic energy. Okay? So don't forget this, because if you screw it up, then of course then it doesn't, he won't get anything that means anything. Okay. For holonomic systems, it's possible to determine the forces applied on a system to make sure its constraints are held. In other words, it's possible to find the forces of constraints, and the method is called the Lagrange multiplier method. If you, if you go back and look at the solutions, say, of some of these problems, like for example this one, we could write down the equations of motion of this, but suppose I asked you, okay, well, what, what is the spring force here on, you know, between mass 1 and the wall? I have no idea. You'd have to use Newton's second law. And, you know, do the free body diagram and then go back and figure out, well, I know that Q1 changes by X amount, and it'd probably be K1, Q1, but then maybe it might not be because then you had the damper in there and that might complicate things, blah, blah, blah. Well turns out that there is an easier way to do that. And what you can do is you can determine determine these kind of forces using Lagrange multiplier method. It allows us to find internal forces. Okay, not the external forces because those we can already find out using generalized force expressions, but the internal forces traditionally are just really tough to find. But with Lagrange multipliers, that's not a problem. Another thing, another way to describe internal forces is constraint forces. The constraint equations associated with the constraints for a holonomic system, well, we can always write those in a particular manner, and this is very generalized, general form, and in particular it's for holonomic systems, all right? But one thing about it is when you talk about constraint equations, don't let this, don't let this uh, throw you that this is so difficult. It's really not. I'll give you an example to keep, always keep in mind. x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. That's when a particle, okay, x, y, this is r, that means it's particles on the circle. Well, if we, if we wrote it as we're supposed to here, then we'd say, all right, well, it's supposed to be a function Q1 and Q2. Then we'll say this is Q1, this is Q2. Well, and this is just constant. All right. So then Q1 squared plus Q2 squared minus R squared is equal to zero. 
If this is scary, think of it this way. We can also write this thing, uh, and the reasons will become more apparent later, as delta phi sub j is equal to partial to phi sub j of respect to q1, dq1, all the way out here to partial of phi sub j with respect to q sub n, dq sub n, plus n, the time part, partial of phi sub j with respect to time, dt, and that's all supposed to be equal to zero. So, for example, we had our, just we just had that specific example, x squared plus y squared minus r squared is equal to zero. Well, if I took the, the derivative like they're talking about here, that's 2x dx. Notice that this, this is like this. So that'd be like 2q1 dq1. There's our dq1, isn't it? And then we'd have 2y dy. And so that's sort of like 2q2 dq2. Well, that would be the next one, or it'd be like this term here. We don't have any time dependence on this. We could put time in here. We could say that, all right, the circle is getting bigger, you know, as a function of time or some sort of something like that. But we didn't. So we don't have to worry about the time. And in fact, all we have to do right here is say that this is going to be equal to zero. Not too bad. And similarly, we could also write with delta phi sub j, all right, and this is for our virtual change, right? This is a similar sort of deal. Again, if we used our our previous example, 2q1 delta q1 plus 2q2 delta q2, that's going to be equal to zero. And the only thing to really change is the fact that we did, instead of using a d, we used a delta. And the other thing that really changes is that the fact that we don't have to worry about that time term because delta t is equal to zero and these are virtual displacements. They're not real. Okay, so if we say that a j i, notice the intentional reverse of the j before i here, a j i is partial of phi sub j. This is, okay, you have, keep this in mind, you have j and that refers to the constraint equation. All right, and then we also have i, partial of q i, uh, refers to the generalized refers to the generalized coordinate. So then, if we put all this this a huge equation all together, then we would end up with a sub j i delta q sub i. That's all this equation is. If we have this summation sign in there, and it sure enough, it's supposed to be equal to zero. That's for the jth constraint equation. And we have 1, 2, 3, all the way through the total of m constraint equations. We have n coordinates and m constraint equations. The i is the generalized coordinate, j is the constraint equation. The constraint equation makes sure that even the virtual displacements are consistent with the constraints. So this has to be true even for virtual displacements. So what I mean is, is like in our previous example, you know, we had the particle on, and this is x, this is y. This, this radius, the circle was r, then it always has to be true that that this particle, if it's going to be staying on a circle, virtual displacement or real displacement, infinitesimal displacement, it still has to be consistent with the constraints. Now then, this equation, all right, these equations, they define a direction orthogonal to the virtual displacement delta q1 plus delta q2, so on and so forth, plus delta q1, which happens to be the direction of the applied constraint force. Turns out that you can write the force of a constraint as a scalar multiple of the constraint equation associated with that constraint. So if you have m constraint equations and you want to find their associated constraint forces, you need m scalar constants. So if you go back and look at this, what we're saying is, is that, all right, if you have 2x uh, dy, dx plus 2y dy, and they are dropped out because we took the derivative, right? Well, what this is saying is, is that this particular direction, if you pick an x and a y, and this is telling you what direction that force is going to be in to hold this thing, to hold this particle on that path. There has to be some sort of force, you know, a normal force that keeps the particle from going off the path, like if it was a wire and a bead or something. 
Well, the direction that that has to be in, and look at it. If, for example, x is equal to zero, well, that would mean the particle is here. That means what that's telling you is, is the force has to be in the, all right, so it's such a way that, that y is equal to zero, meaning it's going to be in this direction, all right? And take a look at it, if x and y are equal to each other, that tells you that the angle is going to be in the 45 degree direction. So if you have m constraint equations and want to find their associated constraint forces, you need m scalar constants. That's because you have m constraint equations. For just one constraint equation, for example, a11, remember this is aji, well j is always going to be equal to 1, isn't it? a11 delta q1 plus a12 delta q1 plus, that should be delta q2, sorry, plus all the way through to a1n delta qn. And so this is sort of like, for example, 2x delta x plus 2y delta y. And so that a11, well that's 2x, uh, a12, that's 2y, and so on and so forth. All right? If we multiply that by a constant, this is sort of like the, this is the constraint force. And you'll see that here in, the, in a bit, what we're talking about. We can actually say this is sort of like the constraint force amplitude uh, if if this part were normalized. Okay, so then lambda 1 is the constant associated with the first constraint equation. So, and then we'd have our Lagrange's equation where this is from the non-conservative external forces, right? And this turns out to be a constraint force. And we're tacking this on I'll show you why here in a minute. Unfortunately, it's it's nice and complex, but we're going to tack this on and say that all right. Well, it turns out that since this stuff is all going to turn out to be zero anyway, it really wasn't going to make any difference. But if we tack this on, we have lambda one times a one i, right? Whereas the ith equation, this is ith, right? Ith equation, and we have several more in here. Each of them for each of the degrees of freedom we have but we have only one constraint equation, so we have j, j, those, those are both equal to one, all right, and we go from there. All right, so since, since this equation, lambda one, this is actually should be two, lambda one, a one one, delta q one, we're just rearranging here, plus the lambda one, a one n, delta q one is equal to zero. We can replace each of these with q one prime all the way through to Qm prime, that's going to be equal to delta W, right? We can add that to, uh, add these both together, we get Q1 prime plus lambda 1, A11, delta Q1. Okay, this goes in here. And it turns out we can do that for the second equation or the nth equation for our degrees of freedom, the Q2 and Qn. So this would be like our Q2. We have only one constraint equation, that's the reason we only need lambda 1 but we have maybe more than one degree of freedom, like our y for our bead on a ring. Okay, but you know, in a real problem, we might have more than just one constraint, and we've been, as we've been talking down to this point, we, we always said that j is just equal to one, only one constraint. Well, it really, the reality is we have maybe more than one constraint we're trying to find a force for. It. Suppose we want to find the constraint forces for all m constraints. Remember that j is equal to one, all the way through to m. Then we'd have lambda 1, a11, delta q1. This is the first constraint equation. And no, it doesn't matter which one you say is first, which one is second, which one is third, just as long as you keep track of it. And this is our last one. Okay. Notice we have lambda 1, lambda, and there'll be lambda 2, lambda 3, all the way down in through here to lambda m. Okay, so notice we're going vertically here, our equations, and then your equations of motion then would become, notice that this is your ith equation, 
And then over here on the right-hand side, see this is the same as just a regular Lagrange's equation. Over here on the right-hand side, we'd have lambda j. So we'd have lambda 1 a 1 i plus lambda 2 a 2 i plus lambda 3 a 3 i plus, and then we go all the way out to lambda m a m i. Notice that what we had before is how this goes vertically on j. Okay, and this now it goes horizontally on J and goes vertically on I. So it makes like a matrix over here on the right hand side. And the thing it is is that we need our constraint equations. Each of them multiplied against a lambda coefficient. Of course we have a Lagrangian T minus V and Rowley's dissipation function is popped in there as well just in case. Best way to try to explain these is with a specific example. By the way, this particular form is called the Fafian. P A F P F A, sorry, P F A F F I A N form. And it's after a guy by the name of Fafian. And the idea is, is you write it in a derivative form so that you can do all of this. Otherwise, um, none of it seems to work. Okay, so in the Lagrange multipliers example, let's say that we have a bead constrained to a wire without a friction. Now we could just do this. How many degrees of freedom do we have? Well, one, two, three is three dimensions. We have it constrained to a wire, so one degree of freedom. And I don't know, we could probably say that maybe we could pick R as our generalized um, variable. That might be a handy one to try to choose. And then we could solve it and get our equations in motion and we'd be done. And we could find our equations of motion. That would be all right. Okay. Hmm. You notice that if we didn't worry about the fact that it's attached to the wire, just since it's on the wire, it has one degree of freedom. It'd have two degrees of freedom without the wire constraint. So it can move in the radial direction, and it can move vertically. So it can move along R and it can move along Z. So if we eliminated the fact that we have this thing called Z equals BR squared, notice that's written there, where that's a, it's a, a, a parabolic wire, parabolic curved wire. We'd have three degrees of freedom without both of these. So it can move freely in like a cylindrical format, and that's just because we've chosen a cylindrical coordinate system to try to make this thing work out. Where this direction here, that's theta isn't it? All right, well, let's presume the constraints don't exist. This is step one to doing this. If you want to find, if we just want to find the equations of motion, just treat it like the constraints are there, job done. It's very easy to do with Lagrange's equations. But what if somebody wrote in here, in red ink, your boss said, oh, what about the constraints? What's the forces on the wire? Maybe the wire is not big enough to hold the bead. Whatever, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. So, all right, to do this, we have to follow a procedure to work with our Lagrange multipliers. So, and the one thing is, is that we need our constraint equations, and then we need a Lagrange's equations that put those constraint equations in, but in a, in a rather unusual manner. We put it in that matrix form on the right-hand side with those lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, all the way through to lambda m. First step along that path is that if you have constraints, if you're wanting to find the forces of constraint, assume those constraints don't exist. All right, they just treat it as if they don't exist. So suppose we're trying to find all of the constraint forces. Treat that as if all of the constraints don't exist. It would then have three degrees of freedom without both of these constraints. This is a constraint equation, that's a constraint equation. We've already written down what the constraints equations are. We haven't written them down in the Fafian form yet, but we at least know what they're going to be. And now we say, all right, the constraints don't exist. How would the particle move? Well, if the wire wasn't there and it wasn't being held by this equation or by this equation, then R is would equal to R e sub R plus Z e sub Z. Remember that you don't have to put in R theta e sub theta. If you don't remember why, then look in lectures one or two. Take the time derivative of this. We can get the, the velocity R dot e sub R plus R theta dot e sub theta plus Z dot E sub Z, and then find the kinetic energy and cylindrical coordinates, which is just R one half M R dot 
that product with itself, which is one half m r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared plus z dot squared. And then the potential energy, well, if we say that the radial line there, if the particle was down at the very bottom, that would be zero potential energy, and gravity is straight down, then this distance here, well, that's z, then the potential energy is mgz. Right, because if you remember, potential energy is minus and a half f dot dr, and this would be z ez, and that would be zero ez, and this f is well, that's mg, and that's mg with the minus sign along the e sub z, right? And m, and what we'd end up with eventually is is it minus mg minus, uh, with a minus sign out front there, minus minus is a plus, and then we have e sub z dotted with itself, with also with uh, z in here. So that gives us mgz down here. All right, so then Lagrangian is t minus v, not so bad, and that's not much to worry about. But now, we, if, once we've got the Lagrangian and we can put in Lagrange's equations, we could do that part. But, and again, remember, we assume that the constraints don't exist because we want to find what, how, much of the, how much of these forces to hold these constraints in place. So then we need to have the constraint equation written in the Fafian form, or this sort of weird derivative form. We've got z equals br squared. And put everything on the left-hand side, z minus br squared. Notice that this is like um, we have three uh, three degrees of freedom, r theta z, is our, um, our, our coordinates that we're using here. And so then let's order them. Here's r, here's theta, here's z. And we're going to look for our a's. All right, we're going to say this is our q1, this is q2, and this is q3, just because it's convenient to remember. r theta z, one, two, three not so bad. So then we're going to look for, if we say this is J1, this is J, AJ1, AJ2, AJ3, multiply it against these things, right? And we're going to be looking for A, well that's 1, so it's A11, A12, A13, and our Fafian form is the derivative of this, it's minus BR squared plus 0 times theta, remember there's no theta in there so we just multiply it against 0, plus 1 times Z because it's just Z by itself. Okay, so if we take the derivative of this with respect to, and use a delta operator in here, this is a 1, 1, because R is Q1. This is a 1, 2, where J is equal to 1, and then this is the second um, variable, so it's a J I. So then this is a 1, 3, and away we go. Now for the second one, we said a theta dot is equal to omega, well, then delta theta dot is equal to zero, right? And this is supposed to be a constant, so that's going to be equal to zero. And our degree of freedom here is really theta, right? And we have r, so we have zero r, oops, sorry, zero delta r plus um, one delta theta plus zero delta z is equal to zero. Because after all, the, all this means is, is that delta theta has to be a constant. And we're just going to say, well, I don't know what we had pick it to be as is a constant, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to let it to be zero. So then, just like that. And remember again, we we're saying that q1 is r, q2 is theta, and q3 is z. So then, for j equals one, this is our first equation, right there. This is our second equation, all right. And this isn't quite right. This this is a one three. This is a two three. Remember, this is j. All of this in a row is is where j is equal to two. This term is a two two. This term is a one two. This term is a one one. And this term is a two one. Remember, j comes first. I come second. And what we're going to do is, it turns out that you can write this as a matrix, right? A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23. But then we'll take the transpose as we're using it, because we're saying this direction is J. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to write Lagrange's equations. In this direction will be I, 
and then this direction will be j. So in a sense, we're going to use like a transpose. Let me show you what I mean. Equations of motion become, this is for q1, this is for q2, and this is for q3. Notice how i is in this direction now. Okay, so then we've got uh, the, all the equations on the left-hand side from the, you know, time derivative of a partial of Lagrangian with respect to r dot, theta dot, z dot, and the dissipation and all of that kind of st that stuff. And then we have maybe our non-conservative forces. Turns out we don't have any. And then we have our constraint forces that happen to be doing something on the right-hand side, or gravity in other words. Right? And so we have lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. So we got lam lambda 3, right? Well, we don't have any a third constraint. We only have two constraints. Remember, this is for our constraints. So lambda 1 and lambda 2. This is a 1, 1. This is a 1, 2. This is a 1, 3. Notice that j is equal to 1 throughout because this is, obviously this is lambda sub j. A one, lambda 1, lambda 1, lambda 1. Lambda 2, lambda 2, lambda 2. Notice that the zeros multiplied against them for the first and last equation. All right. And then we go through trying to figure out what these equations are. If you do the stuff on the left-hand side, you end up with mr double dot minus mr theta dot squared. That's for our q1 is equal to r equation. That's equal to, well, you know, so all we've got here is lambda 1 minus 2br. Second equation, well, that's q2 is equal to theta. That's time derivative of mr squared theta dot is equal to lambda 2. And then look at what happens to the third equation. We get lambda 1 again. That's for the z direction. mz double dot plus mg is equal to lambda 1. Well, the idea of this is, is it's an original equation. Originally, we had one degree of freedom. Okay, and then, oh yeah, we had two constraints, which took us from three degrees of freedom down to one degree of freedom. And said, "Oh well, but what 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 are those forces that are causing holding those constraint? What are the internal forces, in other words?" And so then we said, "Well, okay, we'll say that we've got three degrees of freedom um, for our system, and then we add in." our constraint equations plus these lambda sub j's. Okay? That's the idea. That's how this all is supposed to work. There's a couple of different steps that you notice here. You release the constraint f uh, the constraints and you find Lagrange's equations without the constraints associated with the forces you want to find. And then you use this Fafian form on here to find what your, your lambdas are going to be. Let me show you what happens now. You can eliminate lambda 1. Now lambda 1 here and lambda 1 here, we can just say that this is equal to minus 2br times um, mz double dot plus mg, right? And notice what the m's, we cancel out a bunch of stuff. Um, and in fact, I did here to get us this far. And it gives us sort of like an equation of motion. And you notice then as well that z equals br. Notice we can use the original constraint equations now because we're saying that we're going to make them work again. Okay, so we can go back and sorry about this. We can use those constraint equations now because after all the particle is on that path and this is the description of what's going on with that particle as is theta dot is equal to omega. So if we go back and look here, we can say that theta dot, no, well, no, that's not really theta dot, that's actually omega. So it's this, this is omega, and so forth. So, all right, so z is equal to br squared. Well, that's equal to z double dot is equal to 2br dot squared plus 2br r double dot. And if you put that in, actually, then we can end up with an equation that's just in terms of r for how fast our particle's moving. That's the equation of motion. Remember, we only need one. We only have one degree of freedom. You could find that without Lagrange multipliers, but you couldn't find the following without the multipliers. Remember the lambda one? Well, see, notice that that comes out as a consequence of 
uh, one of these other equations that would have never appeared if we hadn't assumed away the fact that the constraints are there. So we just treated the constraints as non-existing. We would have never have had this, this equation. And since we've treated it as if the, the constraint is um, not there and then we put it back in, then now we can say, all right, we've got lambda 1 is equal to mz double dot plus mg. Substitute in for z double dot. We've got it in here. We'll put it in there, and then we've got 2mbr dot corner, uh, squared plus 2mbr r double dot plus mg. So the force required to maintain the first constraint, j is equal to 1 right here, the first constraint, z is equal to br squared, in the direction of delta r, delta theta, and delta z, such that, okay, in the direction such that this is true, perpendicular to the wire, but in the rz plane, that's the direction of this applied force, then, okay, is this, is this force, lambda 1. Lambda 2, on the other hand, is the one that's required to hold the, the particle in the plane of the, of the wire as it's rotating around. This is the force required to maintain the second constraint equation. Theta dot equals omega in the direction of delta r, delta theta, and delta z such that delta theta is equal to zero. So in other words, this, this is sort of a bad drawing of the, of the wire, all right? And lambda 1 is inwards. Okay, perpendicular to the wire. If you look at the wire from the side, you got your particle. This is lambda 1, and it is a vector, okay? And lambda 1 is in the rz plane, and then lambda 2 is, is in the e theta direction. It's holding, it's pushing against the particle in a horizontal direction. And if we add lambda 1 plus lambda 2, we can get the total force on this particular particle. You don't necessarily always, uh, are always able to do that unless you release all the constraints, but in this case we can. This is a really good example. You should work through it line by line by yourself. This is one of the better examples, even better than the, the, the PRAC problems um, for the purposes of, say, the exam or whatever, or just for you to learn this technique. All right, so how do you do it? Do you do it this way? Don't forget. When asked to find the force enforcing some constraints, assume the constraints don't exist. Don't release... all constraints. Only release the ones that you need to. Why would you want to release all the constraints? Just release the ones that uh, has forces that you wanted to find. So for example, in the, in the, and you had the wire with the mass on it. If I only asked you, you say, all right, well, what's the force holding the wire, holding this particle on the wire in the plane? Then you wouldn't need the second constraint. You would not need um, this constraint, theta dot, whoops, you would not need theta dots equal to omega. You can let that one go. Okay? So assume the constraints don't exist, the ones that you don't need. Then define generalized coordinates and drive the equations of motion if, if step one is true. So treat it as if you don't have those particular constraints in, in force. You have additional degrees of freedom then. Treat it as if you have those additional degrees of freedom and let the particle move, particle of particles move around as if you have those additional degrees of freedom. And get to Lagrange's equations and then stop, all right? Find the equations for the constraints and put the equations in Fafian form. It's AJ1 delta QJ and Q1 plus AJ2 uh, delta Q2 and so forth, just like we did before, all right? If one of the variables is missing, say theta and r theta z, put zero times delta theta in for the missing variable in the equation, just so you can kind of keep track of things. Multiply each equation from this step, okay, step three, that's step three there, by lambda j, okay, and keep track of which equation is which one. This is like uh, j is equal to one and so forth, all right? Keep track of them, and then multiply each equation by lambda j, or, and do that for each of those. The substitute lambda j a sub j i delta q i from each constraint equation into Lagrange's equations. Find the equations in motion by eliminating the lambda j's and then the forces necessary to hold each constraint by finding lambda j itself. The direction of the applied constraint forces is given by the direction of the virtual displacement 
the Fafian form of your constraint in 3. And you can look here to see more details, and there are a ton of examples around. This is one that you have to practice on to understand. All right, so I hope you, you've learned, uh, learned something out of this, and I um, encourage you to give it a shot because it is really quite a powerful method. Thank you.